Tharula Tamimi, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Tharula will talk about mammographic density and breast cancer risk and how she is following in the footsteps of Dimitrios Trikopoulos. Thank you, Pagona. Um, and thank you, Antonia and Michelle, for including me in this program. Um, what some people might not know is that I'm actually an unofficial student of Demetrius's. I sort of snuck in um, and have been very fortunate to have the uh, opportunity to be mentored by him and to be a part of this really great family um, and tradition. Um, I got to meet Demetrius through Hannah Cooper. So Hannah and I were friends, and Demetrius was very generous with his students and always uh, told them to use his office, to use his parking space, um, and we all did all of that. <laughs> um, and um, so when Demetrius was out of town, you know, Hannah would be working in the office, and this was pre-cell phone, so I would come by and see if she wanted to get coffee or chat or meet her and go out afterwards. Um, but as soon as Demetrius was in town, I disappeared. I, <laughs> Demetrius was, you know, he really was a giant and I was very much intimidated and I was like, I'm not gonna interrupt anything that's going on in there. Um, but Hannah kept encouraging me to come and meet uh, Demetrius. And I didn't know about the secret um, <laughs> selecting of the next student and so, uh, Hannah kept encouraging me to, and she's like, you really have to meet Demetrius. And so I eventually met Demetrius, um, and instantly we had a connection. Um, my mother is from Egypt, his mom was raised in Egypt, and we would talk about Mediterranean culture, we would talk about religion, we would talk about, you could talk to Demetrius about anything. Um, and he was just so warm and inviting, and at the end of our first conversation, I think he said, okay, so I think, you know, I'd like you to work with me on a couple of projects, you know, it won't be too demanding. Um, and I was still like an early student, I hadn't completed any of my coursework, I felt like I barely knew SAS, I came up with all these excuses, and he was like, Rula, none of that is important. What's important, <laughs> what's important is that you like the people that you work with, and I can teach you everything else that you need to know. So I really couldn't argue with that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think some of the other students have talked about the environment and the way that Demetrius taught. And I think this is very much typical of our working sessions. And I think Hannah had used the term apprenticeship. And when I think about the time of working with Demetrius, I, it really was an apprenticeship. So for a week at a time or 10 days at a time, we would be in that office working, you know, from morning until dinner at Legal Seafoods. Um, and it was really hot in that office. You can, you can tell that Lorelei and I are dressed in sweaters. We are ready for a Boston winter. And Pagona thinks that it is summer in Athens. So, um, but it really was such a wonderful environment. And we had three computers going at all times. Uh, someone would be doing a PubMed search. Someone would be doing an a, analysis. And we'd be waiting to see the results of the analysis on a dot matrix printer. And someone would have to peel the edges off. And then we'd all huddle around. And it really was you know, a team. We each, Demetrius listened to each one of us and wanted to know what our opinions were, um, how we interpreted it. And then we would sort of regroup, go back to our different stations, and, then, and regroup again, either around this table or on the couch. Um, and a lot of times we had special guests that came from all over. Uh, the country who would participate in these conversations and it was really just a wonderful atmosphere uh, to really learn. It was really sort of hands-on learning, uh, which I think is a really unique experience, um, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I know that we heard a lot about this paper earlier uh, in some of the earlier talks, but I love this paper. I think. Um, I think it, there's so much in it that reflects on Demetrius. I think if you read this paper, you can hear his voice uh, in the words. And I think it also reflects his sort of holistic approach to understanding uh, the etiology of breast cancer. He was always trying to fit different pieces of what we know together. You know, how does the descriptive epi uh, line up with what we know about the epidemiology? And how does that line up with animal models? And he was so well versed in all the different aspects um, and I really loved the way that he synthesized all of it and would come up with a model, come up with this etiologic model 
test a hypothesis, refine it, and come back to it. And I think it's really something that has really um, stuck with me to try and think of the bigger framework uh, when we do our research. Um, so I think I very much uh, have followed in the footsteps and the interests and the passion uh, that Demetrius did. And one of the areas that I do a lot of research in is mammographic density. Um, so mammographic density, um, in Demetrius's terms, really would represent the mammary gland mass uh, in the breast. And you can see from left to right, uh, that going from fatty breast to extremely dense breast here, um, the white on the mammogram is radiodense tissue. It represents epithelial and stromal tish, uh, tissue. And the, and the dark is, is fat tissue and is radiolucent. And there's tremendous heterogeneity uh, in the population in terms of this distribution of, of dense tissue. And it is one of the strongest risk factors for breast cancer. Um, you can see that there's a nice dose-response relationship in, in terms of the relationship between percent mammographic density and increased breast cancer. Um, women with extremely dense breasts, so whose breasts are occupied by 75% uh, dense tissue, have about a four and a half fold increased risk of breast cancer relative to those who have uh, completely fatty breasts. And so this first um, postulate in Demetrius's etiologic model is that breast cancer risk depends on the number of mammary tissue-specific stem cells, which we can interpret as mammographic density here, um, which is determined early in life, including uh, intrauterine life. And one of the um, projects that I was fortunate enough to work with Demetrius on uh, was a paper I think that Pagona had talked about earlier, which was linking birth characteristics to mammographic density. And this was also, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to meet some of our Swedish colleagues and really get the opportunity to work uh, in Sweden. Um, and this was a, a great data set in which they were able to get birth uh, characteristic information from the birth registries and link that to adult mammographic density. Um, and as you can see, we did see a positive association between both birth weight and head circumference uh, in relationship to mammographic density. And if you compare the extremes for either one of those, it's about a five percentage point difference, which is um, it's on par with postmenopausal hormone use, or a, re a reduction would be uh, what you would see with tamoxifen use. So building off that, we've continued to look at other adolescent uh, exposures in relationship to mammographic density. And this is work that's being done by Megan Rice in our group. And I think you heard Walter speak earlier about the inverse relationship that we've seen with adolescent body size and breast cancer risk. And we see a very similar association with mammographic density. And some of the work that we've been trying to do is to try and quantify and, I, and see is, this is the association with breast cancer mediated through mammographic density. And so this is the relationship with uh, adolescent body size with breast cancer, and you can see it's inverse. When we adjust for mammographic density, it's very much attenuated. Um, and uh, using uh, mediation analysis by uh, those in our, in our epi department, um, about 59% of that association appears to be mediated through mammographic density among premenopausal women, and about 30% among postmenopausal women. So again, really you know, showing that these early life exposures are influencing mammographic density, which is then influencing breast cancer risk. Um, I include this paper here because I, this is a, a very fond memory of mine. So Andreas Pedersen was a postdoctoral fellow, <laughs> and poor Andreas worked for both me and Lorelei, um, and basically worked 200% of the time. Um, but one of the things that was, is interesting about mammographic density is that when people usually talk about mammographic density, they're talking about the percent of the breast that's occupied by dense tissue. But what was, and there, that's where you see the strongest association in most studies, instead of dense area, and so instead of centimeters squared, um, which didn't really make sense to a lot of us, and Andres and I would often talk about it. Um, and Andres started to do some analyses, and we kept talking, and Demetrius happened to be in town, and I said, let's just go to Demetrius's office, show him these things, and see what he, see what he says. And this is something that Demetrius loved. He loved the science, he loved the discussion, he loved the hypothesizing, and we had such a wonderful conversation that resulted in this paper, um, showing that dense area was positively associated uh, with, with breast cancer risk independent of the non-dense area, 
and similarly, the non-dense area was actually inversely associated with breast cancer risk, uh, independent of the dense area. Um, and I think this is actually, you know, again, speaking of sort of our next generations, I think the work with Demetrius is one of the highlights that Andreas has and some of the fondest memories that he has of, of his time that he was here at the Harvard School of Public Health. So moving on to the second postulate, um, which states that in early life and in later life, um, mammotropic hor hormones affect the replication rate, um, the likelihood of somatic mutations, and the expansion of initiated clones. Some of my research has also focused on looking at hormonal exposures in relationship to mammographic density and also breast cancer risk. Um, and not surprisingly, I think now in retrospect, not surprisingly, um, circulating hormone levels or estradiol levels were not related to mammographic density postmenopausally. And I think when you sort of think about Demetrius's etiologic model, that kind of makes sense in that the, breast, the dense breast tissue um, is sort of formed fairly early on in life. And so, you know, 50, 55 year old hormone levels would not necessarily be associated. Um, and so what we found here was that both uh, circulating estradiol levels and mammographic density were independently related to breast cancer risk. But what I think is most interesting um, is that if you cross-classified people by their circulating hormone levels and their mammographic density levels, you actually see that the women who are at the highest uh, mammographic density and have the highest circulating levels of estradiol are those at the highest level of um, breast cancer risk. And sort of in contrast or, or you know, following this similar paradigm, um, we know that circulating carotenoids are inversely associated with breast cancer, primarily estro estrogen receptor negative breast cancers, but we also saw some heterogeneity if you looked at mammographic density. So the women that seem to have the most reduced risk of breast cancer um, due to uh, associated with the circulating uh, carotenoids are really the women who have high mammographic density. So putting all of this together and, you know, building off of Demetrius's etiologic model, um, I, I completely sort of have drank the Kool-Aid and I believe that the mammographic density is established fairly early on in life. And so the areas that I would like to continue to explore are really what are those other factors that influence this great uh, heterogeneity that you see in mammographic density patterns um, in women. And then really, Given that we can see that these women with high mammographic density are at increased risk, I really think that you know, one of the areas that we're trying to explore is given the same exposures, it seems that the effect is really among the women who have the high mammographic density. So they have the cells that are at risk, you give them hormones, they're the ones that are going to have the increased risk of breast cancer. So in the future, this is where I'm sort of hoping to continue to try and identify either modifiable factors or other ways to really differentiate um, which women are at the highest risk of developing breast cancer. Um, so leaving the science behind, I did want to speak a little bit about uh, Demetrius, and I think you've heard a little bit of this from his other students. And unfortunately, I don't have enough pictures of myself or of us with Demetrius. But the way that Demetrius mentored and the way that we all worked together, he really fostered this family environment. Um, and so I'm so fortunate to know the other students and especially the students that I overlapped with, Hannah and Lorelai. I feel like they are my sisters in science. Um, we have traveled together, we have laughed together, we have cried together. Um, it's really been an amazing family and uh, you know, I feel like Demetrius is the patriarch of that family and I was very fortunate to have snuck my way into this, <laughs> into this family. And then sort of echoing um, what Lorelai had said, so this is Adam and Eve. Uh, so <laughs> Adam, Adam is my son and Eve is Hannah's oldest uh, daughter. Um, and Demetrius loved children. He loved to hear about our children. I heard about Lisa's children and Lauren's before I had even met them. So. It had always been an important thing to him. And I also have a very fond memory of, Demetrius was one of the first people also to meet Adam in, <laughs> at the hospital. Um, and I think it just goes to show how important his, you know, I, I don't know what else to call it besides family. So um, 
and I, I put this here really to say that I feel like it's not only us and our, and our children, but also our students and our mentees, I think, who have benefited greatly and will continue to benefit from uh, Demetrius's great science and mentorship. So thank you.